Hello and welcome to Review for You, a twice monthly journal about people and events of interest in the San Francisco Bay Area. My name is Peter Kumarda, I'll be your host for tonight, and we're broadcasting to you live on the San Francisco Public Access Channel, AT&T 99, Comcast Channel 76, and um, Astound Channel 30. Tonight I have a special guest, uh, local artist, Teddy Goldsworthy Hanner. Welcome to the show. Thank you. <laughs> uh, Teddy is uh, internationally known and she teaches here in the Bay Area at the Academy of Art University. So we're going to take a look at some of her work and talk a little bit about her life and what it's like to be an artist and how fabulous that can be. <laughs> and uh, we hope you'll enjoy it. So let's start out, Teddy, talking about how you became an artist. I think people are always interested in, in knowing that. And, and I knew, knew that was something you were going to ask me. So I was trying to think, how did I become an artist? And I can't remember ever not thinking of myself as an artist. Since I was a child, it's where I knew I needed to be. So most of my life has been spent acquiring the skills that I needed to to reach the level that I could make a living off of what it is that I needed to do. So when did you first know that you were going to make a career as an artist or that was going to be your primary occupation? I think once again it comes with I, if you asked me as a child what I was going to be I would have told you an artist. I don't think there was ever any doubt. How to make it a reality was something I really started planning probably um, about the sixth or seventh grade and from that point on every focus I had was how do I get myself there. So it's something that has has been brewing a long time and I, and I often think that it's been in, in my soul since I since I was aware of having a soul. <laughs> That's pretty powerful. Well, um, now that you're an accomplished artist, uh, <laughs> what is your process like? Has it become uh, a fairly regular thing for you to produce artwork? Is it like a hen laying eggs or is it more like <laughs> a... I like the hen laying <laughs> eggs part. I don't know how not to do it. Uh, Sometimes I have other responsibilities that take me away from it, and I'm very uncomfortable when that happens. But I realize that everything I do, even the teaching I do, leads me to my work. So I've learned to be a little more patient with myself with regard to, oh, I'm off doing something else, but I need to be creating art, in understanding that my art is the narrative of my life and I need to have those other experiences to have a, any kind of a narrative. And where do you think your ideas come from? Is it uh, again you know something that comes unconsciously or do you search for ideas or projects to work on? Or Only occasionally do I get blocked. Usually I, ideas are just like breathing to me. I, I have something I want to work on. It's always, well, of late in my career, it's always related to to those things that are important to me and that are happening basically in my life. Um, it is definitely a narrative, a personal narrative that, that I've been fortunate enough to find an audience for. Um, also, a lot of times just the act of teaching and being with creative people, creative students all the time, even though they're not all fine artists, um, really feeds my artistic soul. It's, it's a wonderful inspiration. Um, so um, you are now, uh, I guess, describing yourself as a mixed media artist. Tell us a little bit about the different media that you use. Well, I was traditionally trained as a painter and a sculptor. Um, I also have a background in glass blowing, and for years did that with my partner and husband, late husband. Um, and that was important, but in terms of being an artist, one of the things I know that I love is process. And, you know, it's just a part of who I am. So if I want paper in my work, I somewhere along the line realized I had to understand the making of paper. So I make paper, I've made books. Um, I, when I first started, um, probably the first art school I was ever in, uh, in Washington, D.C., one of the things we had to do was make our own pigment. That may have started that whole process of having to be involved with every element in what I'm doing. But now I've gotten to the point where I've added encaustic into my work, and it's really, really feeding that 
process drive I have. And so encaustic, just for the audience, is wax it's, and pigment it's together? wax and pigment together, loosely speaking. And then and from that point, you take it where you need to. Um, somewhere uh, in the slides we're going to be showing tonight, there's an, an encaustic piece that I can sort of describe in terms of material, which makes it a little clearer, I think. Okay. Well, let's take a look. Let's start looking at some of the artwork, because that's, of course, the core of why we're here. Um, let's bring up the first one. Tell us a little bit about this piece. Beach Rose. Yes, um, <clears throat> it's the beginning of a series that I sort of think of as my saying goodbye to Alameda. Ah. And, and there's a, a further excuse, which you, you'll be showing later on, that sort of explains where I'm going. Unfortunately, I was saying to a dear friend today that uh, I, it seems to be getting to be a bigger series than I ever intended. <laughs> a long goodbye. A long goodbye, yes. And it's, the rose is an important icon to me, and, and bringing Alameda and the zip code into it, like I said, that was kind of a part of Beach Rose. It was, it was a, a loving goodbye, because I've loved living there. I am just uh, have reached a point where I'm ready to move on to something else. And um, you are very concerned with autobiography in your work, so there's always those sort of little touches of real life in what you're doing. That personal narrative has always been important in my work, but but I reached a point, and I think when I was a graduate student at the Academy of Art is when it really hit me full force that I had to, for me to be, to have the kind of voice I wanted in my work and to reach the kind of audience I wanted to and to accomplish what I wanted to in my work. I needed to literally put myself directly into it. Um, you know, an artist is always in their work. It's just how much. You know, is it uh, a beautiful painting and, and what the artist is seeing and feeling is the beauty, or is there something more to it, something more direct to the artist? And You mentioned in some of your literature that you got started in some of this artwork by working on female nudes, and then you came to look at yourself and then the question of was not just what is a female nude, but who am I mm -hmm. sort of came up. Can you describe that process? Because that's very interesting, actually, how that... Well, it's my thesis work for, at the Academy when I got my MFA um, was about reclaiming the body of woman. And like many artists my age, I'd been raised in, in classes in art, art history where it's mostly about the male view of the woman's body. Um, so I wanted to do something that reclaimed that body, that had a, a, a female languaging of body, of a female's body. And I thought, the, huh, <laughs> two years later I didn't agree with myself, but I thought at the time, <laughs> what better way to do it than do it by self-imagery. Right. Imagery. And it just became a really difficult thing because I had to learn to see myself not the way I saw myself interior-wise, which so many women do. You know, you are harsh critics of yourself. But I had to actually try and create paintings of myself that other people could recognize me, too. And that was hard to do. That was a, a real, a very deep learning process. At the end of that, I did a couple of pieces that really delved into the me of my work and opened this door for me and really brought language into my work also. Um, one of them, Collage of Life Quilt, uh, Let's is, take a look at that one now. 